Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. So I'm Laura. Who are all of you? Who, who here is actively building something right now? Raise your hands. Oh, sweet. Excellent. Good for you. All right, this is who I am. I wrote a couple of things. Um, and I am writing a new thing, specifically a book. Uh, one of the things that happens when I write books is um, that I, I talk to a lot of people who are building things, and I want to talk to all of you about the things that you're building and put it in my book. Um, and I start to notice patterns, which is an occupational hazard of being a user experience designer. We notice patterns and things. And the biggest pattern that I notice is that all of you are building the next billion dollar unicorn, right? Or if you're already at a big company, if you're already at a big company, right, you're, you're transforming the culture or you're changing everything, you're disrupting something. You are, right? Whatever you're building, it is going to be huge. Good for you. Here is some totally unsolicited advice. So one thing that people have been saying to me for about eight years um, is that they are going to be the next Facebook. That is a fantastic idea, and I totally support it. Facebook's huge, right? It's got, what, 1.5 billion people, right? That's, that's, a, that's a good size market, right, even for now. So just, I just want to make sure that I understand you all correctly. When you say that you are building the next Facebook, what you mean is that you are going to start with a very small, specific core group of users, and you're going to solve a really, really specific problem for them, right? That, I mean, obviously, that's what you meant, because that's how Facebook started back in, you know, 2004. Um, for Harvard students, look at other pictures of Harvard students. Pretty specific. In fact, <laughs> here's a picture of the Facebook from 2005, which is the earliest I could find in the Wayback Machine. Um, this is the company, by the way, that has over 1.5 billion users now. This was a year after launching. They are actually listing, as you can see, all the new schools that they're opening up to. In fact, they didn't open up to even non-college students until 2006. In fact, they did not do a rollout to everybody for two and a half years after forming the company. For two and a half years, they limited their user base to a really specific group of people with a really specific problem. In other words, even Facebook didn't start out the next Facebook. And oh, um, by the way, all of you who are worried that your product isn't pretty enough or perfect enough to launch, you may thank me later. So, you know, when, when you say you want to start the next Facebook, I'm just going to assume that what you're saying is that you know, you've identified that core group of users and uh, you're going to solve a specific new problem. And that is a fantastic idea and you should totally do it. You will be the next Facebook. But some of you these days don't want to be Facebook anymore, and that's okay. You want to be the next Slack, right? You're working on a B2B product. Fantastic. Who doesn't want to be the next Slack? So since you can't hire Stuart Butterfield to make you a game, which is, of course, the right way to build the next Slack, um, I'm going to assume that what you're going to do is you are going to build a product that solves a problem for a team with whom you work incredibly closely. Yeah? I mean, that, that, that's what you're planning on doing, because that's how Slack started. It was an internal tool built to support the company that, it was, that was building it. That's basically the origin story of something called uh, Amazon Web Services, which you may have heard of, which is now actually bigger than the retail company that it supports. See, the reason that this strategy of building for internal teams works so well is that the team that's building the internal product is working really, really, really closely with the team for whom they're building the product. Like, they're sitting right next to them. And there's a good chance, if there are other teams like yours in the world, that there will be other teams with the same problems you all have. None of you want to be Facebook or Slack anymore. You all want to be the next Airbnb. And that is huge. That is the definition of huge, because they are taking on the hotel industry. Just checking. When you say that you want to be the next Airbnb, I'm guessing that that means that you want to start out by renting out your own apartment. 
And uh, maybe you're going to go out and you're going to take a bunch of pictures of things, and then you're going to rigorously A-B test to make sure that that actually made a difference. Obviously, that's what you meant when you said you wanted to be the next Airbnb. Because, of course, that is all a part of how Airbnb started. We all know the story, right? The founders were living in an unaffordable apartment in San Francisco. Who can imagine such a thing? And uh, they rented out a room during a design conference to make a little extra cash. They sold custom cereal to support themselves while they went out and they actually took photos of apartments themselves because they realized that the photos that their users were taking were just horrible and were scaring people away. They didn't start out by taking on Hilton, right? They started out doing everything themselves until they couldn't anymore. But that all sounds kind of exhausting, doesn't it? That sounds awful. Maybe you want to be the next product hunt. That sounds easy, right? Any idiot could do that. Oh, I'm sorry, shit, is Ryan still here? No? Good? OK, good, we can talk. Um, so I'm just going to assume that when you say that you want to be the next product hunt, what you mean is that you are going to create an incredibly passionate community of users who care deeply about something, and you're going to test all of your ideas without writing any code. Maybe using, I don't know, email list, something? and that you are going to like network and blog and hustle until you can build that email list into you know, a real community, and then, then you'll turn that community into a product. Because again, I mean, Ryan didn't start out as he, you heard him, he didn't start out with an app and a team and a website and millions of dollars in funding. He started out getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and finding a bunch of products that he thought were cool and sending them to people who agreed with him. And remember, it was a lot harder to do that two years ago because he couldn't just find all the products on Product Hunt. Is anybody starting to notice a pattern here? It's still too early in the morning for that. I know. It's, the obvious pattern is that, god, products are hard to build. I don't mind if you haven't noticed another pattern. It's, you know, Still kind of early, and you probably didn't know there would be a quiz. But the pattern here is that none of these companies started out big or popular or well-known or hip. Three out of four of these are worth billions of dollars, and I have a you know, reasonably good feeling about the fourth one. But none of them started out that way. I mean, OK, obviously, right? Nothing starts at a billion dollars. But I think we forget just how small, how focused, how really limited all of these products looked at the beginning. And I don't, I don't want to kill the buzz here, but just, just for a second, let's talk about some companies that maybe didn't do it this way. All right? Talking about companies like these, right? Now, products fail for a lot of reasons, and I don't want to get into all the different ones, but one of the mistakes that I see a tremendous number of you making is that you worry so much about getting so big and getting to so many people before figuring out your key users and your key business models. This isn't a new thing, by the way. I mean, this is basically what happened to Webvan, who decided that you know, they were going to build out an entire national distribution center of grocery dis you know, distributors back in the 90s be you know, before they figured out if anybody wanted to buy groceries online. Here's a tip for everybody in the audience under 40. <laughs> we didn't. Or at least, you know, not enough of us did. It's like all of these companies were so intent on getting huge fast that they didn't realize that they needed a sustainable business model. They needed decent unit economics before pouring a bunch of people into the top of that funnel. I shouldn't have to explain to you that you need to make more money off of each user than you spend acquiring them. There was literally an I Love Lucy episode about all of this. Now, the problems that I see at bigger companies are uh, they're similar. But it's hard to point to examples because a lot of these products never make it out of the executive suite. But just for fun here, of the folks who are at large companies, who have worked at large companies before, how many of you have heard some variation on the phrase, <laughs> We don't want to work on that idea here. That's too small. That wouldn't move the needle. Anyone? 
Yeah, all of you? Yeah, that's what I thought. See, when large companies focus too narrowly on picking big ideas, they miss the small ideas that turn into big ideas. Conversely, when they do try small products, they'll sometimes just sabotage themselves by pushing these small ideas out to everybody in the market without realizing that these products need time. They need time to find their natural markets. They need time to grow naturally. <laughs> Here's a fun story. Um, back in 1995, uh, I was at a think tank. And the entire goal of the think tank was to predict the next 10 years of technology. You know, what could people possibly be doing in the far off year of 2005? And so one of the UX designers, this is a true story by the way, uh, one of the UX designers there, not me, went to one of the senior people and he said, uh, hey, what about this internet thing? It seems like it's going to be kind of a big deal. And the senior guy said, uh, eh, I don't think so. I think we should keep working on interactive CD-ROMs. This story absolutely horrifies me because this guy was not dumb. This was an incredibly smart guy who had already been incredibly successful. The problem was that in 1995, the internet didn't look as big as it does now. Interactive CD-ROMs were still a really big business, which I, many of you have never used one. <laughs> See, when big companies are too focused on big ideas. They just, they miss those other ideas. And CD-ROMs were big business. So why on earth am I telling you all of this? I mean, if I'm just standing up here telling you like, hey, products are hard. Yeah, you don't need me to tell you that. You guys have figured that out by now. You don't need me sitting on the porch shaking my cane at you. Kids these days, you don't know how tough it was back in the winter of 2000. The walkers came over the wall. That's when things are hard. See, I'm telling you because it's really easy to look at Facebook or other big popular things and think that, that's what I want to build, and just go out and make a copy of it, right? Facebook for small businesses, Uber for laundry, Airbnb for pterodactyls. I don't know, something. But you can't do that. Those companies didn't do that. That's not how Facebook or Airbnb or Slack or Product Hunt started. Yes, they had big dreams. They had big visions. That's great. Nobody, no matter how curmudgeonly, wants to take your dreams away from you. I swear I don't. But I want to help you try to make them come true. So I'm going to give you a few practical tips for maybe having a better shot at making this stuff a little easier or you know, possible. So first tip, big things start small. Smaller than that. Smaller than that. Mm, little smaller. There we go. OK. Um, sometimes it's possible to, to tell that an idea is going to be huge, right? Not always. Facebook didn't start as a big idea. Didn't even really become a big idea for a couple of years. In fact, MySpace wanted to buy Facebook back in 2005 for $75 million. It's a million with an M. Sometimes big ideas look big at the beginning, and sometimes they look like this. I love this screenshot so much, by the way. I'm never going to stop showing this screenshot. It is fabulous. Even what we think of as the beginning for a lot of these products are after they've been around for you know, a few years. And they've gone through thousands of iterations with thousands of early adopters who care deeply about them. I mean, between eBay and Amazon, you can currently buy two of anything in the world. But they both started in you know, individual categories. Building everything for everybody is expensive and fraught with danger, <coughs> Jet. <clears throat> Although, um, I do want to point out that if this is what the internet looked like in the 90s, and it is, I kind of don't blame that guy for missing it. All right, enough of that. Second tip, global things start locally. Look, a lot of products these days, they're hyper-local. You know, they connect you with services near you, house cleaning or meal delivery or drone surveillance. But if it's hard to launch these companies in one location, and believe me, it is hard. It is infinitely harder to launch them everywhere simultaneously. Even Airbnb, which, we, as I have pointed out, is now bigger than the entire hotel industry, is still keeping things small and testing things locally. Apparently, there's a thing called Journeys that uh, they are doing. It's a tour guide service. 
they connect you with a tour guide. It is, I believe, only in San Francisco. It is invite only. And if it doesn't work, you will never hear about it anywhere but here. Look, the reason you need to get it right locally is that it's really hard to change stuff in a lot of different places at once. And it's a lot easier to kill something if it isn't working if you only have to kill it in one place. Launching locally in a really limited way helps you find all those implementation assumptions about which you were entirely incorrect. I mean, even Amazon, which is like, you know, pretty good at logistics, they're launching one hour delivery very slowly and in limited cities. I mean, okay, now I know that someday I will be able to order anything I want and they will just deliver it to my house by drone in under an hour and then I can finally achieve my dream of never leaving home. But not yet. Even one of the best companies in the world at this stuff knows that global products start locally and spread. All right, for our third tip, automated things start manually or to quote Paul Graham, which I do not normally do, do things that don't scale. When Airbnb hypothesized that maybe people weren't renting places on Airbnb because they all looked like murder houses, they didn't go out and, you know, pay professional photographers to go out and take shots of absolutely everybody's house and do a big program. No, they went out with a camera. They took better pictures, right? They did it all themselves. They figured out if it was worth doing, and they did it until they couldn't do it anymore. You can do that too. You can do it by not building and automating stuff until you absolutely have to. If you do things manually until you can't, you will find out that sometimes you don't have to build anything at all because nobody wants it. And that is incredibly useful to know about because you save a lot of time and money that way. Here's your last tip from the land of the obvious. A billion customers starts with one customer. I know this may just seem like math and semantics, but no product starts at a billion. Every product has a first customer. You need to focus on the experience for that first customer. Make that first customer's experience fantastic. And the hundredth, and the thousandth, and the ten thousandth, before you even start to think about the billionth, because you will never get to the billion if you don't make those first hundred happy. So let's recap very quickly. If you want to be the next Facebook or Airbnb or Slack or Product Hunt or Uber or whatever, and my research tells me that you all do, you are going to have to first be the next you. And you are going to have to hustle and you're going to have to work your asses off and you're going to have to be patient. But hopefully, these tips will make things a little easier. Remember, big things start small. Global things start locally. Automated things start manually. One billion customer starts with one. Nothing is a guarantee. None of this is easy. But I've seen people try it the other way, and it has not gone well for most of them. Trying to build everything for everybody is a great way to build nothing that anybody really wants. So get out there and get a billion customers, eventually. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this is me. If you have questions, send me an email. <laughs>